This is Harsh Rules, I'm Ben Harsh, and today we're going to take a look at the prototype for 1941 Race to Moscow. 1941 Race to Moscow is the next entry in Phalanx Games' World War II Logistics Racing Series. Phalanx Games will fund the production of this game with a Kickstarter campaign that begins on November 18th, 2019. They were kind enough to send me a prototype of the new game to preview on my channel. So let's take a look. These World War II logistical racing games are not focused on battlefield tactics and combat. Instead, the emphasis is on supply and making sure your armies have enough food, fuel, and ammunition to reach their goal. The first game in the series, 1944 Race to the Rhine, allowed up to three players to assume the roles of legendary allied generals, Patton, Bradley, and Montgomery. Although all members of the allied forces, these men also had legendary egos, each itching to prove who was the best general. Players competed with each other to manage their resources to break through German defenses and be the first to cross the Rhine River. The next game, 1941, Race to Moscow, takes place on the Eastern Front during Operation Barbarossa. This time, players assume the roles of three German army groups, Army Group North, Army Group Center, and Army Group South each racing to be the first to get their army to a key Soviet city. Much like the first game, the army group that reaches their city first receives all the honor and glory. As you can see, the components for Race to Moscow have been significantly upgraded from the original wooden meeples and blocks of Race to the Rhine. And although these are prototype units, I'm sure the final game will look even better. Next, let me give you a general idea of how this game works and then we'll look at the setup prototype. This is the prototype game board for 1941 Race to Moscow. Now, I'm not going to cover every rule in this preview, but I will summarize the board layout and component functions to give you a better idea of how this game actually plays. With that said, let's get started. In this game, each player takes on the role of a quartermaster for a massive German army group, each aimed at a key city at the heart of the Soviet Union. The army group that reaches their city first wins the game. Army groups are typically composed of field armies of soldiers and armored armies of panzer tanks. Each of these armies is represented by a plastic miniature. The main difference between these two army group types is as follows. Armored groups must be activated individually, but can move to three spaces. Field groups can all be moved with the same activation, but they can only move one space at a time. However, players can spend an extra food marker to initiate a forced march and move them two spaces. Each army group is made up of a different number of these army types and as a result, play very differently. Several of these forces begin the game in spaces already under German control and secured railways. These are printed on the game board in that group's color. As the army groups proceed into Soviet territory, they will place control markers on Soviet spaces they take over. One side signifies the army group that owns a space, and the reverse side indicates that that group has secured railways in the area. In the last steps of a player's turn, they may advance their railway by flipping one of these markers to the rail side. Railways and roads enable an army group to keep their forces supplied, using a limited number of trucks and trains. A supply chain with trucks can transport four supply markers. Trains can transport six supply markers. Supply lines are represented by the arrows on the board between spaces. Supply chains are constructed by placing trucks and train miniatures on these arrows. But be aware, the reach of your supply chain is limited by the number of trucks and trains you have at your disposal. And obviously trains will only travel as far as the railways that army group has secured. Players will use these trucks and trains to transport resources from their supply bases, the iron crosses at the bottom of the game board, to their armies in the field. After all, 
Soldiers require food, vehicles require fuel, and both require ammunition to deal with the enemy. Each unit has an army card that shows the amount of supplies that they can carry with them. It's the player's job to keep those cards full, because an army will quite literally spin these supplies off their card to enter spaces on the game board. Let's pause for a moment and talk more about this game's logistical flow. This game is heavily focused on trains. After all, the game box looks like a World War II version of the Polar Express. But to be fair, there's a reason why the train is highlighted. Let's build a simple supply chain with trains and I'll show you. In this example, the food marker is at the bottom game space and we want to transport it up to the top space where there's probably some starving German soldiers. Fortunately, the tracks to the destination have been secured so we can use trains, otherwise we'd need to use trucks. By placing a train on the arrow between spaces, you can shift the food to the next space. However, by doing this, the line is now jammed. Essentially, empty trains are coming back and blocking the railway. The player then places another train and moves the food again. This jams the next line. We continue the process and the food finally reaches its destination. So as you can imagine, the board is going to get cluttered up pretty quick with empty trucks and trains. This is an additional challenge in the game because players will need to carefully plan out their supply lines to ensure their forces are properly supplied. So you might be wondering, how do you get this cleared up so fresh supplies can get flowing again? There is a game trigger called a theater reorganization that will allow players to clear the board and restock their supply of trains and trucks. Essentially, when you look at the transport logistical flow in this game, there are only 26 trains in play. Eight trains are pulled out into reserve until the first theater reorganization, nine trains are placed in transportation stock that players can draw from, and each player gets three trains to go along with their five trucks. Players will then put these on arrows on the board to transport their supplies, and when the transportation stock is depleted, all trains and trucks are taken from the game board and restocked again. Now, since all players are sharing from the same stock of planes, you can begin to imagine the problems that start to occur. One army group can be hoarding trains, or drawing more trains to trigger a theater reorg at the worst possible time. Therefore, don't be confused. This is not a cooperative game, this is a competitive game. It's also important to note that each German army group has a specific lane and target city to conduct their operations. I'm going to highlight these lanes in an army group's color so it's easier to see. German Army Group Nord, or North, the gray player, has a lane on the board's far left. This army is trying to reach Leningrad. Army Group Mitte, or Center, the white player, has a lane in the middle of the board. Their goal is Moscow. Army Group Sud, or South, the brown player's lane is on the right. This group is trying to reach Rostov. Some edges of these lanes overlap. These spaces will be split in color. Normally, an army group is restricted to the colors of their own lane. However, either side can occupy these split spaces. But be aware, the first army that claims a split space makes it prohibited to the neighboring player. This can lead to some fun competitive sparring between army groups. One final note when tracing the path of each lane, you'll notice that Army Group North and Army Group South can ignore their cities and head straight for Moscow. This is an alternate way for these two army groups to win the game which, as you can imagine, makes it even more difficult for Army Group Center to win. Spaces containing a star hold Soviet forces. At the beginning of the game, markers are placed to represent the Red Army. Similar to spaces containing Soviet forces, hexagon-shaped spaces that I've bordered in red are fortified spaces that require the player to spend ammunition resources to enter. Strategic spaces in each player's lane is marked with a victory medal. If an army captures the space, they win the medal, which counts as victory points. 
If players are unable to reach a Soviet city, then the player with the most medals wins the game. Now, let's look at the differences between each army group. Army Group South has three field armies and one armored army. Their lane is the widest, and while every army group begins with a supply base, Army Group South has a forward supply base as well. Army Group Center is composed of two field armies and two armored armies. Their lane is the narrowest and sandwiched between the other two groups, which can make them very challenging to play. Finally, Army Group North contains two field armies and one armored army. This army group's lane is unique because it is adjacent to several naval ports and has a fleet at its disposal. This fleet can be advanced along the coastline like an army unit and is useful for cutting off naval supply lanes that allow field and armored units to surround and eliminate enemy Soviet forces. Now that we know the different army groups better and we're more aware of the landscape, let's discuss movement, encounters, and combat. Each player's turn is comprised of three phases. The Action Phase, the Railhead Advancement Phase, and the Conduct Soviet Reaction Phase. Most of gameplay takes place during the appropriately named Action Phase. In this phase, players can move their units, transport supplies with their trucks and trains, draw supplies or transports, or additional actions such as playing cards, and using planes for air reconnaissance. We've talked about many of these already, so now let's focus in on the movement action. With a player's two actions per turn, they can move all their field armies, which cost them one food, or one armored army, which costs them one fuel. Army Group North can also use this action to move their fleet. When players move an armored army or their field armies, they will experience encounters. Encounters occur when an army attempts to enter a new space. These encounters usually come in two varieties. Spaces that contain a Soviet marker and spaces that do not. First, let's discuss the spaces that contain Soviet markers. When attempting to enter a space with a Soviet marker, the player draws a card from the Soviet deck. This tells the player how many supplies are required to defeat the forces in that space and move in. However, it's important to be very aware that once a player commits to moving into that space and engaging in combat, they must spend the supplies they have whether they have enough to defeat the enemy or not. If a player is low on supplies, they can then use their plane figure to conduct aerial reconnaissance. This ability allows the player to place their plane figure or plane marker on a deck of cards and look at the next card that will come into play. This gathered intelligence enables a player to learn the supply cost of entering the next space or what other surprises lie in wait. If a player moves their army in and combat occurs, they also get to subtract one from the ammunition cost. After setup, it may appear that the Soviets are only a threat at the beginning of the game. This is not true. Soviet markers will continue to spawn onto the board throughout the game. As one of the last steps of a player's turn, they must place a Soviet marker on the game board. Generally, a Soviet marker can be placed on any unoccupied space as long as it's adjacent to an existing Soviet marker. Or, if an existing Soviet marker is adjacent to a player control marker, then the player may counterattack and remove that player control marker to place the new Soviet marker. Now, this is a series mechanic that began with Race to the Rhine, and it can be a little bit wonky for players to assume the role of the enemy as well, even if it is fun to try to stymie your opponent's progress. Well, Race to Moscow has a solution for this by introducing Player 3.5. This is a variant of the game that allows you to recruit another player to assume the role of the Soviets to place these markers. According to the creators, this is called Player 3.5 because it's really half of a player role, not a full-fledged role for another player. In my opinion, though, this could be a good spot, spot for a new player trying to learn the game by watching everyone else. In any case, that's another option for players of this game. 
If a player enters a space they do not control and does not have a Soviet marker on it, they draw a card from their Pursuit deck. Each army group has their own deck of Pursuit cards that depict different events that the player resolves when entering. Think of these as random encounters. Sometimes you'll find supplies, sometimes the enemy, but always something unexpected. If a player is struggling to make progress against these obstacles, they can always seek help from the OKH, the Oberkommando des Heeres, or the German High Command. The German High Command is represented by the OKH deck. Throughout gameplay, there are always four of these bonus cards available for players to place their staff card marker on and receive a bonus. By the way, Phalanx, some German staff car minis would be pretty cool. Maybe as a Kickstarter bonus? Hopefully this overview for 1941 Race to Moscow gives you an idea of how the actual game will play. Be aware what I've shown you here just scratches the surface of what this game has to offer. I didn't have a chance to get too deep into Player 3.5. Although my prototype didn't have it included, I understand there are actually Soviet general cards for this player. My assumption is that these weren't finished when the prototype was shipped out to me. The Soviet tokens also have symbols on the backside that can be used with the 3.5 player version. This gives the Soviet player more control over which cards the Germans will encounter when they try to invade Russia. As you can see, I had a lot of fun making this video, so I'm hoping to come back to this game when it's released and give it a proper tutorial. Now, the last thing I want to show you is just a brief clip showing you the actual prototype of the game in my office. So here it is. Check it out. Okay, so before we go, this is the prototype set up in my office. So as you can see, I've got all the army cards out. I've got the supplies on the army cards, I've got tokens set up, um, I have the OKH deck with the four cards spread out, there is um, the Soviet deck, and I also have all the miniatures you can kind of see, you know, just to give you an idea of the perspective. I know when I shoot my classic style presentation video, sometimes I have to blow up images so not everything's to scale, and I wouldn't want you to think that, you know, that things are bigger or smaller than they really are. So this is the actual prototype and these are the game pieces so you can see what that looks like. So now that you've seen that, let's take a look up farther at the game board. So here on the lower left side, you can see the supply area and I have a bunch of extra pieces. So those are piled up. So then you can see the miniatures and you can see all the different lines the Soviet markers. Here is the, on the far end, here is the kind of the train station. So there's the stock in the reserve. Um, and moving up, you can see the medals and all the Soviet victory cities. And that's really it. Um, so if you're interested in this game, Head on over to the Kickstarter. It's going to launch by this recording date tomorrow, November 18th, 2019. Um, like I said before, this is all prototype material. So when the final game is produced, um, it will probably be much, much better. Um, you just got more to look forward to when the Kickstarter is funded and they produce the actual game. So as always, this has been Harsh for Harsh Rules. Thank you so much for watching. And I'll see you on the next video. If you found this video helpful, please give me a like and share with your friends. To be the first notified when the next episode of Harsh Rules becomes available, please hit the bell icon for notifications. And as always, this has been Harsh for Harsh Rules. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you on the next video.